So good morning, everybody. Welcome again to today's seminar. Uh, our guest today is Dr. Melas, Dr. Evangelos Melas. Uh, let me uh, tell a few words about him since he, this is the first time he speaks in this series of seminars. Uh, he finished the physics department of the University of Athens uh, in 1990. And then after a, a postgraduate uh, course in Democritus, uh, he got his master's degree from the Imperial College in London uh, on quantum fields and fundamental forces. He continued with his uh, PhD at the Queen Mary College in London in 2003 in mathematical physics. And since then, continuously, he works at several uh, universities in England and then in, uh, in Greece, in, mainly in Athens and in other, in other universities as well. Uh, and uh, today, uh, currently, he works at the Department of Economics of the University of Athens and in other, some other positions. Uh, you already have, uh, you see on, on the screen, the subject of the talk, Asymptotic uh, Symmetries and Representation Theory in General Relativity in Three and Four Space-Time Dimensions. And uh, so we're ready to, to start. Thank you for being with us. You can immediately start. Okay, thank you so much for your kind invitation and giving me the opportunity to talk to you about the research program. I'm working um, uh, a number of years. Um, so, and this research program has to do with symmetries and the associated uh, representations uh, in general relativity. I will focus on in three and four space time dimensions, all those um, complementary research program can be expanded in any number of uh, space time dimensions. Um, Um, so this is the structure of the talk. Um, I'll tell you a little bit about the origin, uh, so how all this started, and then I will move to three space-time dimensions, and I will comment on a few results I have uh, derived uh, res recently in this direction. So all started from a fundamental paper in 1962 from uh, three great uh, physicists of the time, Bondi, Mesner, and uh, Zax. And so the main problem they were looking at was the following. They knew from the fundamental paper of Einstein of uh, 1905 that uh, when uh, a body emits uh, electromagnetic radiation, then um, the electromagnetic radiation carries away uh, the inertia of the body, so carries away the mass of the body. Um, in, co in contradistinction, they, we know that in um, electromagnetism, when a charge uh, emits gravitational radiation, uh, then the charge uh, is not carried away by the electromagnetic radiation. So they posed the same question in the context of general relativity. So the question they posed was the following. Imagine that you have a source uh, which uh, occupies a bounded region in space time, which is um, quiet for a while. Then uh, the source emits gravitational radiation, and then uh, the source goes uh, quiet again. So the main problem in their research paper was uh, the following. Uh, does the gravitational radiation carry away the mass of the source? Uh, and in order to address this question, they had to model the, these bounded sources which emit gravitational radiation. And the way they did that is that they postulated this class of metrics that you see here, and this class of metrics describe precisely this type of problem. So this class of metrics uh, uh, describe bounded sources, which are quiet for a while, then emit gravitational radiation, and then they go quiet again. If you want to have a specific problem, uh, a specific uh, paradigm uh, example uh, in this direction, you can think of a pulsar. So you have a pulsar. Uh, which is uh, quiet for a while, and then um, it bursts uh, radiation, uh, both electromagnetic and gravitational radiation, and then goes quiet again. So these functions you see here in the, in the, in the components of the metric tensor, this beta, gamma, u, and uh, v, uh, uh, this v function, are functions of ur and uh, theta, as I'm going to say in a while. Um, so you have in front of you a class of metrics. It's not a single metric because the functions v Vita, Gamma, V, and U are free functions. Uh, in order to simplify 
their treatment, they made an assumption. Uh, remember that in those days, they didn't have the very powerful uh, um, computers we have nowadays. They did all the calculations by hand. So they had to do a simplified assumption because the calculations were enormous. Actually, they, it took them six months to complete the calculations. And uh, so they assumed that the functions, the free functions you see in the metric are functions of ur and theta, so are not functions of phi. So uh, they made this, so there's an axial symmetry in the problem, and they made this assumption just for simplicity purposes, but it turns out that even if you drop this assumption, and this was done by Zacks uh, a year later, uh, you derive the same results. So the fact of axial, the assumption of axial symmetry uh, does not have any uh, restrictive uh, um, repercussions regarding the, re the results. The new thing they brought with this uh, work was to um, introduce a coordinate system was which was well adapted with the physics of the problem. I this is something which was not done before. And actually, this um, uh, simply this simple tool, as it might be seen from uh, the eyes of nowadays, uh, brought a great simplification to the problem and actually uh, solved the problem. Uh, so what they did is that they, they introduced these coordinates. Theta and phi are the usual angular coordinates on the surface of a two-sphere. R is the usual radial coordinate, uh, which um, measures the distance from the bounded source, which emits gravitational radiation. And this U here um, is constant on the outgoing null hypersurfaces. Now, you are interested in the outgoing null hypersurfaces because exactly these are the hypersurfaces on which the gravitational radiation uh, travels along and uh, they wanted actually to study the region of space-time which is described by this um, uh, these uh, conditions here so they want to go away from the source but they want to remain on these hypersurfaces because on these hypersurfaces is precisely where the gravitational radiation uh, travels uh, and actually, they wanted to uh, impose another condition, and the, uh, the other condition they wanted to impose was the following. The kind of situation you have is that you have a bounded source which emits gravitational radiation, and remember that the, the bounded source is quiet before, and actually it's the only thing you have in your space time. So you don't have any uh, incoming radiation. In order to impose that, on their class of metrics they postulated, they used an assumption made uh, in a, uh, by Sommerfeld in another context. Sommerfeld made this assumption not in the context of general relativity, but he made these assumptions in the context of uh, special relativity. So the assumption you make is that these functions, Vita, Gamma, U, and V, which appear in the components of the metric tensor, assume this asymptotic expansion in the far field zone. When I say far field zone, I mean the area of the space time, which I specified before with the conditions I wrote down. R has to be very large. You are far away from the source and you are, uh, you are sitting on the null hypersurfaces, which are parameterized by U. Uh, and in, in this area of space time, these functions assume this asymptotic expansion. So uh, this is an, is an expansion uh, in terms of the radial coordinates R. And this, uh, 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 these uh, powers of the R are multiplied by coefficients, which are functions of U and theta. Remember that we have axial symmetry. We do not uh, assume any dependence on phi, but we, uh, as we already said, all these have been rederived re by Zacks, even dropping the assumption of, uh, of axial symmetry. So what you do is you make this assumption, you feed um, uh, this metric into the Einstein's equations, and the Einstein's equations, uh, what they tell you is that they tell you which is this uh, dominant power. So it tells you which is the leading uh, power in R in this asymptotic expansion. So you know this K from Einstein field equations um, for each uh, of these functions, Vita, Gamma, U, and V. So one of the authors of this paper, actually Mesner, uh, in a short paragraph of that paper, uh, posed the following question. Uh, do we have any isometries in this space-time, uh, in this class of metrics? In, in fact, you don't have a single space-time, you have a class of space-times. 
And uh, because the class of metrics they postulate, it is quite general, you do not expect to derive uh, coordinate transformations which preserve the exact form of the metric. And actually, this is what happened. You do not have these coordinate transformations. You do not have such isometries. There are no isometries which preserve the um, uh, form of the metric because the form of the metric is very general. But uh, Metzner knew that. Uh, so what actually he was interested in if that is that the following. He, post he asked the following question. Do we have isometries, coordinate transformation, that means that they do not preserve the full form of the metric because this is not possible, but they preserve the leading coefficient. Imagine, uh, sorry, remember that as we said, that everything, these four functions, Vita, Gamma, U, and V, and along with them, all the components of the metric tensor admit this asymptotic expansion. So imagine that uh, a component of the metric tensor admits this asymptotic expansion. Uh, so you are looking for coordinate transformations which do not preserve the exact form of the metric, but they preserve the leading coefficient. So if this metric component starts with that uh, squared, uh, you want uh, those coordinate transformations which uh, the component of the metric tensor in the new coordinate frame starts again with r bar squared. Uh, now, the rest of the terms can be different. So the powers in here uh, are not the same in general with the powers of r in here. Uh, what you are interested in is the main, uh, the leading uh, power uh, as, you, as r tends to infinity. Now, uh, what I want to clarify here is that uh, uh, Mesner posed this question not just uh, as an interesting um, exercise for uh, postgraduates. Actually, one you can set this one can set this as an exercise question. Uh, 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 there is a very fundamental physical significance uh, in this question, and the fundamental physical significance is the following. In general relativity, the idea, the, the information about the presence of gravitational radiation is in space time is encoded in this power here. Actually, this power here tells you if you have gravitational radiation or not. Uh, so actually what Mesner uh, in, in effect was asking is to find the corresponding of inertial frames in special relativity in the context of general relativity. And the corresponding notion of inertial frames in this context in general relativity is to isolate those frames of reference in which you do observe gravitational radiation because this is the problem you have at hand. So you are asking to find all the coordinate frames in which you observe gravitational radiation. This is what you are asking. And, um, uh, the, there was an expectation, and the expectation was the following. Because you go very far away from the source, the curvature of space-time dies off. And uh, in, if you are at infinite distance from the source, you expect that the curvature actually is zero, so you expect to recover as isometry group, as asymptotic isometry group. I call it asymptotic because you are very far away from the source. And um, to recover the Poincaré group, to, the, to their very great surprise, they did not recover the Poincaré group, but they recovered a much larger group. Actually, the surprise at the time was so large that they uh, tried to introduce all kinds of, arti uh, of, um, uh, of artificial assumptions in order to get rid of this larger group and to, to go back in the Poincaré group but they did not succeed in doing so with any kind of uh, physically reasonable um, assumptions. So the uh, group which they discovered is this group here. Now this group here, uh, in order to clarify a little bit uh, which uh, group is this, so these are the coordinate transformations which preserve the asymptotic form of the metric and uh, describe all the frames of reference in which you observe gravitational radiation. Now, um, these uh, transformations here you see at the bottom uh, here, this, uh, these two transformations are the conformal transformations of the two sphere on uh, itself, which preserve orientation. Uh, so these transformations here are actually isomorphic to the connected component of the Lorentz group. In other words, these transformations here are nothing but the Lorentz group. 
Now, these transformations here, uh, if, you, if this now, uh, because these transformations here are conformal transformations of the two sphere on itself, in their definition involve a conformal factor. And the conformal factor they involve in their definition is this K here you see. Now, this A here is an arbitrary function defined on the two sphere. Now, if we make the following, uh, if we look at the very, uh, at the following specific case, um, imagine that this K here is, uh, take this K here to be one and take this A here to have a, a specific form, which we are going to show in a little bit. Uh, then uh, these transformations here, so for K1 and for a specific form of A, these transformations here are nothing but the rigid translation in four dimensional Minkowski space time. In other words, in this transformation here, a subgroup is the Poincare group, which we're going to uh, clarify in a little bit. So these transformations contain as a subgroup the Poincare group, but is a much larger group this, because this function here um, is, uh, is arbitrary function defined on the two sphere. Um, and um, well, I, I commented on this uh, before. Uh, so let's go. So this, these transformations I showed you before, if we do a little bit of algebra, they have this structure here. This is a reminiscent of the Poincaré group. Actually, this is the Lorentz. This is a semi-direct product. This is the Poincaré group. Sorry, this is the Lorentz group. And in the Poincaré group, you have the rigid translations in four-dimensional space-time. Uh, here, you have a much larger group, and we are going to comment how, why and how this group contains the rigid translations. So this is uh, the rigid translations are a subgroup of this group here. This the rigid translations are a four-dimensional group. This is an infinite dimensional group. We are going to comment it on, uh, on a while. And you have here a T. This T is uh, actually a, re a representation of the Lorentz group in these functions here, in this space of functions. And the kind of representations here is given here. Now, uh, this representation specifies this uh, direct product, semi-direct product. Now, this kind of representation uh, has an intu intuitive meaning. Uh, so the way you can understand this is the following. Imagine that this A is the light intensity distrib distribution on the sky. And imagine that you move in a direction with a high velocity. So uh, part of the intensity distribution is blue shifted. And part of the intensity distribution, the one which you have at your back, is red shifted. Actually, this transformation tells you how the light intensity distribution of the sky is red shifted um, according to your according to your movement. Um, this is an intuitive way to understand this representation. Uh, in any case, this is the largest group which you discover and which preserves the asymptotic form of the metric, and it gives you all the frames of reference in which you observe gravitational radiation. So just to say a little bit why this uh, space of functions contains the rigid translations in four-dimensional space-time. Now, these space of functions are functions defined on the two-sphere, admit an expansion in spherical harmonics. You can write these space of functions in this form here. This is a direct product. Uh, this V, the four, the first four terms in this asymptotic, in this sorry, in this expansion here, the first four terms uh, form a four-dimensional vector space, and the rest of the terms form an infinite-dimensional uh, vector space. The first four terms, which constitute a four-dimensional uh, vector space, um, is this vector space here. And actually, one can prove that this space here is nothing but. Uh, the space of rigid trans the four dimensional vector space of rigid translations in the four dimensional Minkowski space. So actually, uh, the presence of gravity, what gravity does is that it, it enlarges this V here enormously and makes it infinite dimensional by adding to it this uh, infinite dimensional uh, vector space. So the gravity, the presence of gravity, and all its consequences are contained in this infinite dimensional extended of the four dimensional vector space of rigid translations in four dimensional Minkowski space time. So, um, uh, yeah, we talked about it. And uh, just say a little bit. Oh, okay. Now, 
one might wonder uh, one might wonder what's the physical meaning of this super trans of these translations here which i call it which i call them super translations um and now this super has nothing to do with supersymmetry so these are generalized translations uh, so these uh, generalized translations have the following uh, physical meaning imagine that you have a bounded source imagine that you have a two, uh, imagine that you have a sphere with uh, which has at its center this source and imagine that at the surface of this sphere you have observers which synchronizes their clocks at a common time u and imagine that this source which lies at the center of the sphere emits gravitational radiation and the gravitational radiation passes through the surface of the two sphere now the clocks of the observers are desynchronized because of the presence of gravitational radiation and after the presence of gravitational uh, wave uh, when the observers look again at their clocks they see every observer looks u which was the time at the beginning before the passing of the gravitational radiation plus this value of the function or at the place theta and phi where the observer is located so every observer uh, has a different time and has a different time because of the passage of the gravitational wave this is the meaning of super translations in four dimensional space time okay so this is what i'm this is what i'm saying here okay now this is one pillar of the of the research program i'm working on the other pillar of the research program i'm working on is the fundamental paper of wigner which he, he wrote it a few years before the 62 paper which is a 39 paper by wigner in which he found for the first time the representations of the poincare group actually is the first treatment in mathematics of the infinite dimensional representations of the Lie group and in this paper all the modern quantum theory of fields is uh, based upon so in this paper Wigner for the first time he gave the theoretical definition of an elementary particle he showed uh, that an elementary particle is that elementary entity which carries um, an, in, an, um, a repre an irreducible unitary representation of the Poincaré group. Uh, and he showed that the, these representations, uh, so the elementary particles are parameterized by their mass and their spin. And all this comes out from the study of the representation theory of the Poincaré group. Um, and uh, this is what i am saying uh, here now uh, one show is tempted to do the following uh, the class of groups uh, the class of metrics which were postulated by bondi and mesner all of them have the same asymptotic symmetry group which is the bms group so one is tempted to do what Wigner did by replacing the the, the poincare group by the bms group and describe the elementary entities the elementary particles by using the representations of the uh, bms group instead of using the representations of the poincare group uh, so actually this is the research program i'm working on and this research program has many directions and many facets and i'm going to comment uh, uh, on a few of them in uh, the subsequent part of my talk actually uh, i'm going to comment on a few results i derived the in the in three space-time dimensions and towards the end i also comment uh, a compare what happens in the four space-time dimensions so we can repeat what uh, bondi and mesner uh, and zacks did in four space-time dimensions we can repeat it in three space-time dimensions and we can recover the BMS group uh, there. And uh, uh, actually, this is what I did. This is actually what I did uh, following an idea of McCarthy, which he first did that for the BMS group in four space time dimensions. Uh, so by following that idea, uh, I did the same in uh, three space time dim uh, uh, dimensions and I recovered 
I found uh, analogs of the BMS group. Uh, and uh, in fact, I found uh, 35 uh, such groups. It might sound as odd uh, why one finds so many groups. The reason is the following. And I told you that um, in the original BMS group, one recedes from the source in light-like directions, but one in space-time can recede in many other directions. And so one discovers BMS-like uh, groups uh, when uh, one recedes from the source, uh, not in light-like directions, but for example, in time-like directions or in space-like directions and so on. So one recovers BMS type groups by receding in um, different directions from the source. Now here I have described in algebraic terms how I derive these groups. These groups can be, can be derived in many different ways. They uh, can be derived in the way uh, uh, the <coughs> Bondi, Mesner and Zacks derived their original group, but nowadays one can derive these groups in other ways. I have uh, written here uh, the algebraic way which I derive these groups. Uh, every type of derivation has its own merits and drawbacks. Uh, I use the algebraic way. I'm not going to comment much on this uh, because if somebody is interested on that, we can discuss about this later on or, or I can refer um, to the relevant references. I feel that um, if I comment a lot uh, on these uh, issues, we might uh, look at the trees and uh, miss uh, the forest. Uh, so I skip these transparencies, which their only purpose is to um, specify the algebraic derivation of these groups. And what I'll show you here, I'll show you the general structure of these groups. The, all these groups have the same general structure. And the general structure of these groups is um, as the one you see here. So. Uh, you have H, so this is a Lorentz uh, uh, type group, and uh, you have A, uh, the corresponding way of A in uh, four space time dimensions was the two sphere. In that case, as you may remember, you, we had the functions on the two sphere. In general, A is a, sp is a space which is locally compact. This is a space of functions defined on, the, on this uh, locally compact space. Uh, so these are generalized translations. And uh, actually, this, uh, the, the translations, the generalized translations form a subgroup of the big group. Actually, they form a normal subgroup. But in any case, this H is the Lorentz type group. And this K here uh, is the field of real numbers or complex numbers. You might uh, wonder why it, uh, it could also be the field of complex numbers. Well, this uh, research program advocates a, a research idea which is at the heart of uh, Penrose's program in uh, trying to unify the very big and the very small, general relativity and um, quantum mechanics. So. Penrose uh, believes that uh, uh, complex numbers uh, are intimately related uh, with the workings of the subatomic world. So we advocate this idea uh, is in our heart. So we find also the complexifications of this group because we do, we do believe that they have um, something to say, their representations have something to say about the structure of the subatomic world. So to give you an idea, uh, of these groups. Uh, this group you see here is the corresponding of the original BMS group in four space-time dimensions. So in the original BMS group, here you had SL2C. You might say, but we did not have SL2C. We had the Lorentz group. Uh, well, if you are not familiar with this, SL2C is nothing but uh, the double cover of the Lorentz group in four space-time dimensions. And this SL2R is the double cover of the Lorentz group in three space-time dimensions. If that causes some confusion, uh, this is nothing but the Lorentz group in uh, three space-time dimensions. And this, uh, you, uh, we remember in four space-time dimensions, we have the space of functions on the two sphere. Now we have the space of functions on the circle. So this is the original, uh, the corresponding of the original BMS group. Now, 
if we're working on a space time with the, with the Euclidean signature, this is the Euclidean BMS group in three space time dimensions. Uh, if we recede from the source, not in light like directions, but in space like directions, you derive, uh, we derive uh, this group. This is the corresponding of the so called spy group in four space time dimensions. And these groups have a common complexification, and the common complexification of this group uh, is this group here. Uh, so this is only to give you an idea of uh, these groups. Uh, so the results of this uh, research are contained on a paper uh, written on 2017 and also on a paper I, I wrote recently and I have submitted uh, for publication in the journal uh, PI. Uh, so the group I am working, uh, the, the group I'm describing is the corresponding of the BMS group. Now, the, uh, this is a, a bit more spe specifics about the group. I describe it in algebraic terms. I'm not going also to give you many details about this because I don't want the, the algebraic details to distract from the general picture, picture and the physical meaning which underlies uh, this research. Because a deep physical meaning, I believe in this research and um, I don't want to concentrate many, a lot on the trees and uh, lose the forest. In any case, uh, this is the SL2R, which is SL2R is the Lorentz group in three space-time dimensions, and these are functions defined on the circle. Uh, this L2 you see here are functions, um, are square integral functions, but now I go into the algebraic details and I don't, I don't want to uh, uh, divert a lot on the algebraic details. These are algebraic details on the definition of the group. Uh, now, I want again to say that there's a similarity. Again, the super translations can be split into a three dimensional, finite uh, dimensional vector space, which is the rigid translations in three dimensional Mikovsky space time. And again, the presence of gravity is uh, manifested in this infinite, infinite dimensional extension of the three dimensional vector space of rigid translations in three dimensional Mikovsky space time. So we have a complete analog with what happens in four space time dimensions. Um, the, uh, and this again is the rigid translations in three dimensional, uh, in three dimensional uh, space time. And again, the presence of gravity is manifested in the presence of sigma. Now, uh, I, I'm going to say only a few words about the representation theory. Again, I'm not going uh, to say a lot about this because uh, we're going to uh, go in a lot of algebraic details and I don't want to do that. Uh, I don't want to distract you uh, from the main point of this presentation. So just to say a little bit about uh, the meaning or the, the, the representation theory. As I told you, the, the first fundamental paper is the paper by, by Wigner. And uh, Maki was a mathematician who generalized uh, the, uh, the paper by Wigner and put all this in a fair math mathematical uh, basis, sound mathematical basis. And uh, so all this, uh, so we refer to it as Wigner Maki's theory. So all this, what it is about, is a theory, systematic theory, about how to find the representations of these groups here, which are, have, uh, have this form. And the main idea is the following. Under certain conditions, one can construct the representations of the, of the big group out of re representations of some smaller subgroups of this big group. This turns out to be a, a, an extreme simplification, and you can make this problem tractable, which otherwise looks untractable because of the infinite dimensionality of this group. And uh, uh, so the main idea, I repeat, is the following. Uh, uh, you, you construct the representations of the big group out of the representations of, of some of its subgroups. Now, these subgroups, are called uh, little groups by physicists, are called stability groups by mathematicians, and they have a simple physical meaning. In terms of massive particles, imagine that you have a massive, that you have a massive particle at rest uh, in your frame of reference, and you consider the following question, uh, which is the subgroup of the Lorentz group which leaves the momentum of the particle invariant. So which uh, leaves the momentum of particle zero in case you have a particle which is at rest 
at the origin of your frame of reference. Now, this subgroup of, this subgroup of the Lorentz group, uh, of course, is the three-dimensional orthogonal group of rotations in the case of four dimensions, or is the two-dimensional orthogonal group of rotations in the case of three space-time dimensions. So um, these are the so-called stability groups or little groups. They are so stability groups because they stabilize, they live invariant the momentum of the particle. Um, uh, and um, uh, out of the representations of these smaller groups, you one can manage and construct the representations of the big group. Here I have a few technical details which I don't want to comment upon because uh, they are going only to cause confusion, at least in the first um, grasp of these ideas. What I want to comment a little bit upon is that this is the form of the so-called induced representations. They are called induced representations because you, they are the represent, these are the representations of the B group, of the BMS group. They are induced from the representations of the small groups, right? And the form of the representations are these you see in the red. Now, a, a, a two comments to make um, these uh, strange looking formulas a little bit more transparent. Now, this psi here are the function, uh, are the, is the space of functions where these representations are materialized. Now, what this tells you, if it doesn't tell you anything, uh, it's something very simple. This psi, this psi you see here is nothing but what you uh, call in uh, quantum mechanics the wave function. So this psi here is, the, is your wave function. Is your wave function which describes the elementary entity, your elementary particle. So the module, this is a complex valued function, and the modulus of this function gives you the probability to find the particle in a certain region um, of space. Um, and this is the way your symmetry group acts on your wave functions. Now, if you forget about, just forget a little bit about the, uh, this square root at the beginning. You just look at the other part, right? Now, uh, the, the, this other part is very typical in physics. It's not new in, with the BMS groups. It's so typical. So the typical situation you have in physics is the following. You have a group which acts on a space. Now, in this particular uh, case, you have the group G which acts on itself, and you have functions which are defined on this space. And uh, the action of the group on itself induces an action of the group on the functions which are defined on the space. And this is the typical way this action is defined. If you are wondering about the meaning of this factor here, this factor here is a kind of Jacobian of this transformation. Uh, and the only, it must be there because a fundamental requirement of this representation is that they have to be unitary. This is a, 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 a requirement which uh, goes at the heart of this research program. Uh, all these representations have to be unitary. And why do they have to be unitary? Because and uh, when they are unitary is the only way to assure the following. Different observers in different frames of reference have to agree about the modulus of this uh, wave function, because the modulus of this wave function is the probability to find the particle in a certain region of space. Different observers have to agree about this fundamental entity, about the probability, cannot disagree about this fundamental entity. So. The representations have to be unitary, and in order to be unitary, this factor here should be included. Now, this is how the group G acts on your wave functions. We do this group G. When I say the group G here, this is the Lorentz group. But we also have the super translation. The super translations also act on these wave functions, and the way they act on these wave functions is a little bit different. So as you observe here, they live in variant the wave function. They don't change it. They leave it as it is. The only thing they, they do to the wave function is that they multiply it with this factor here. And this factor here is nothing but, although it looks a little bit strange looking, is nothing but a complex number. This is a number. It's a complex number of unit modulus. It's a phase. It's a phase. So the way the super translation act on the wave functions is that they multiply them with the phase. 
And just a, a last comment, uh, if somebody wonders why these representations are called induced, where is the, where is the inducing pro process? I, uh, so I, we cannot see here that the, at the first grasp why these representations are induced from the representations of the little groups. Well, the answer is the following. This phi here is the momentum which is left invariant, um, sorry, is the momentum which is uh, left invariant by the, the stability group. Um, as uh, you might remember, I said a little bit earlier that uh, if you have a particle at the origin of your frame of reference is left invariant by the group of rotations. Uh, so this phi here is the momentum of the particle um, uh, and it's um, associated with it is the little group, right? The little group li lives invariant this phi here. So this is where the little groups come, uh, do ca uh, come in. And also the other point where they come in is that these functions here, these wave functions are vector functions. They, they take values in a vector space and the, where they take values, they take values in the vector space. In fact, in the Hilbert space where the representations of the little groups are materialized. But in any case, um, these are the representations of the big group. Now, um, just to say uh, something about the little groups. The little groups we find are, um, uh, the, as I told you, I told this before, is the little group which lives in variant the momentum of the particle. Uh, if, if this is at rest uh, at, your, at the origin of your frame of reference. And we also find discrete little groups. Actually, we find as little groups, the um, cyclic groups of uh, even order. Now, I want to make two comments about the representation theory, which has uh, have deep physical repercussions. The first thing is that all these groups are compact little groups. Now, why this is uh, important from the physical point of view? This is very important from the physical point of view for the following reason. Uh, as you might remember, in the case of the Poincaré group in, the, in four space-time dimensions, but also in three space-time dimensions, there are little groups which are not compact. When we have little groups which are not compact, these imply continuous spins for elementary particles. But elementary particles do not have continuous spin. As we, as we observe in nature, we do have only discrete spins. So it appears here, and this requires a more and more fundamental understanding, it appears here that the presence of gravity explains the discreteness of the spins of elementary particles. And this is manifested in the representation theory of groups which take into account the presence of gravity, as opposed to uh, symmetry groups which do not take into account the presence of gravity. And also, I want to say something else, which I consider very important and which is part of this research program. Is the first time in the representation theory of symmetry groups, which we study in physics uh, and, have, and have to do with space-time and space-time theories, that we have uh, little groups which are, uh, which are not continuous little groups, so which are finite and discrete. This also appears in four space-time dimensions. Actually, in that case, we have a plethora of um, finite discrete groups. And uh, in this case, these groups are symmetric groups of the regular uh, polygons in ordinary uh, Euclidean uh, space. In four-dimensional space-time, we have all the symmetric groups of platonic solids. Uh, which appear are fi as finite symmetry groups, little groups. And behind them, uh, there is a fundamental physics, which uh, has not been totally understood uh, yet. It's an open question. And this uh, uh, physics has to do with the subatomic uh, world. Uh, we have uh, very important uh, clues to believe that uh, these finite little groups bring with them a new physics, a new understanding of the subatomic world. Now, 
Uh, this is a, a little bit more commenting on the representation theory, but I don't want to comment on this because uh, this has a theory behind it. And um, uh, here I have in the blue, I have a, an intuitive understanding of why the little groups are compact. And uh, the intuitive understanding is uh, the following. Uh, it, goes by it goes by contradiction. Suppose that you don't have uh, compact little groups. You, you have little groups which are not compact, then they must contain uh, boosts with very high velocities. But then uh, if you have boosts, if you move with a very high velocity, part of the sky is blue shifted, but part of the sky is red shifted, and you cannot find um you cannot find um, um, a light an intensity distribution phi which remain invariant under this uh, boost uh, so uh, in order to have um, comp in order to have uh, non compact uh, little groups you should have intensity distributions that they uh, remain invariant under such boosts and you do not have such distribution, so you do not have non-compact little groups, you only have compact little groups. Um, so these are the corresponding uh, phi, which remained invariant under uh, the little uh, groups. Now I want to make a last comment, and the last, well, there are uh, two more points here, um, which are a little bit uh, technical. One point is that uh, the group we're looking at is not locally compact. That, that necessitates to prove that the, uh, the representations we derive are irreducible, but in fact, we can prove that. And also, we can also prove uh, that the group we're looking at is uh, regular. That means that all we construct by the inducing, we derive all the representations of the group we do not miss anything. So now I want to make a, lack, a last comment. There was this big uh, collaboration between Harvard and Yale, and they found recently that the electron is spherical to within 30, order, 30 orders of magnitude um, is uh, it's spherical to, to, within, to within 30 orders of accuracy. Uh, now, this has, uh, this has a consequence for what we are saying here. And the consequence is the following. Now, we have the famous Birkhoff's theorem in uh, general relativity. And the Birkhoff's theorem says the following, that if any spherically symmetric solution of the Einstein, on the Einstein, of the Einstein vacuum field equations is static, that means that they, it does not contain gravitational radiation. So uh, that means that the BMS group, which takes into account uh, the presence of gravitational radiation, uh, describes entities uh, besides the, uh, at least the electron. So in order to find the physics which um, lies in the representations of the BMS group, which we have to look at larger energy, energy scales. And uh, just to clarify a possible uh, misunderstanding, which might be caused by what I just said, the BMS group also contains part of the representations of the BMS group are also the representations which describe uh, the electron. So um, because in the representations, the representation theory is rich enough uh, to tell you everything, to tell you also um, what happens that when you do not have a, a presence of gravitational radiation. So the representations of the BMS group tells you what happens when you do have and when you do not have gravitational radiation. And uh, in the, the electron does not emit gravitational radiation because at least in this order of accuracy is spherical. Uh, so it's described by that part of the gravitation of the of the representations of the BMS group, which um, describe entity describe space times which do not carry gravitational uh, radiation. But part of the representations of the BMS group, in particular, those representations which are induced from finite groups, we have strong reasons to believe 
that they're intimately uh, related to elementary entities in the presence of gravitation, gra gra uh, gravitation uh, radiation, and they describe workings uh, of the um, subatomic uh, world in uh, larger energy scales. And the, uh, and the last comment, the last comment is the following. One might pose the following uh, comment or question. In three space-time dimensions, we do not have gravitational radiation. So one might wonder, what's the meaning of super translations? We do not have any clocks here. We do not have any desynchronations of clocks. So what's the meaning of super translations and what's the meaning of um, the representations of the BMS group in three space-time dimensions? Well, the answer to this is the following. In three space-time dimensions, the presence of gravity is manifested in global degrees of freedom, i.e. is manifested in the topology of space-time. So one, one expects both the supertranslations and the related uh, representations to be tied up with the topology of the three manifolds, which are solutions to the Einstein equations in three space-time dimensions and which admit in future light light directions, which admit the BMS group as a, symptot as a symmetry group. Uh, so this, is, this was my presentation. Uh, thank you so much for giving me this uh, uh, opportunity to tell you a little bit about the uh, uh, research program I'm working on uh, in the last few years. Thank you so much for your attention. So thank you for your talk. Uh, uh, I admit it was a little bit out of our of the field of the audience. So I'm wondering if there are some questions to clarify some things or something. Is uh, anybody who wants to ask something here? Uh, we're not all experts in this field. So what is the take home message from the first part of your talk? This black hole emitting radiation for some time. What did we learn from that? Practically. Did you get the question, first of all? I, I, I didn't hear it very well. Uh, what uh, is, uh, which uh, is it would be repeated. Uh, yes, uh, the comment is that we're not all experts in uh, what we're doing here, but so we're trying to get to uh, understand the forest, as you said. So from the first part of your talk, what is the message? One, one sentence. What? What did we learn from this black hole that emits radiation, gravitational wave radiation for some time and then loses mass? I, I missed that, yeah. Yeah, the, so the mass of the source is diminished as it emits gravitational radiation. This, this is what happens in classical general relativity. And this is known from the from 62. Actually, uh, this is what they observe in the, in all the in the new experiments they make with, with LIGO and so on. Uh, they detect this gravitational radiation, and they have experimentally confirmed uh, the loss of mass as it emits gravitational radiation. This is the classical side of things. The quantum side of things is the, the representation theory I talked about and uh, brings with it new information about the physics which happens in the subatomic world in the, and in the quantum regime. Uh, this, this is what it is. You're suggesting that the electron emits gravitational radiation? Is that the all, all entities, uh, however small they are, uh, if they are in a kind of motion, according to general theory of relativity, applies to any uh, scale when it, com when it is combined with quantum mechanics. And yes, indeed, this is the case that an entity, however small it is, if it is in an irregular motion, emits gravitational radiation. So the proper group to study the elementary entities in the subatomic world is not the Poincaré group, but is the BMS group. So the right isometry group is the BMS group at the generalizations, and they should replace the Poincaré group in the study of the subatomic world. This is the main message of this talk. Well, that's, that's nice to be clarified. Uh, anyone else who wants to ask something?
Uh, let me check if there is any question. Uh, yeah, okay. Uh, give this me just a, a moment to see if there is anything else here. No, if not, then uh, again, yes, so there is one this, question uh, more. This is more general question. You said that the gravitational emitting, uh, radi radiation emitting object loses mass, but we also have this theorem that the, the surface of the black hole has to increase. So I thought that uh, we're here, we're more interested in this uh, uh, blunt force Nyack process where the black hole loses an energy electromagnetically. And when that happens, the mass of the black hole, although it loses energy, but not due to gravitational radiation, it, the mass grows. So the, the area of the black hole has to grow. There is something that is called the irreducible mass, which is Christodoulou. It's later than this uh, reference that you have. So can you comment on that, that yes, it loses energy, but the mass, the rest mass, Great. this M parameter grows. That is yeah. more general question, may, may have nothing to do with your talk, I don't know. Um, yes, I, I'm, um, right now I cannot, uh, I cannot see the, the connection. In order to answer your question, I have to see the connection Right now, I do not uh, see the connection. I have to look at the relevant references and I don't want to give an answer about something which uh, I, I don't know about. Yes, the, the area of the black hole has to grow. This is counterintuitive. And if it's a spinning black hole, for example, it has energy uh, in the rest mass and in the angular momentum of the black hole. So it loses angular momentum, it spins down, but the rest mass of the black hole grows with time. This is counterintuitive, but that's what happens. So that, that was my comment here. Yeah. Sure. Uh, okay, I'm, uh, I'm interested on, uh, in your question, although I cannot answer it. Uh, could, you, could you give me your email or uh, have any... You, you, you can check uh, Christodoulou and Ruffini. Uh, it's around 1969 or later than that. Yeah, okay. Um, okay. Yeah. okay. Okay, yeah, it's an interesting issue. Obviously, cannot be discussed further at uh, the end of this talk. Then if there is no other questions, then let's thank the speaker again. Yeah, thank you very uh, much. Well, thank you so much. And also I would uh, like to ask you the following. Recently, I'm working on another area, which I feel uh, it might be closer to the interests of your center. Uh, I'm working on um, um, on, on a study of dynamical systems for a, for a certain, from a certain perspective. Uh, so if this is possible, I don't know if uh, it would be possible after a certain while to give uh, another talk on that part of my research. I don't know if this is possible. So well, this... uh, let, I will check the schedule and I will contact you. It is just a matter of scheduling it. All right. Okay. Okay. Is, yeah. okay. So, okay. Thank you again for the time being, at least. Okay, right. th thank you very much. Bye-bye.